Good morning, good evening, everybody. How are you doing? Uh, so we'll have a nice talk today about cosmic computing. So, well, first of all, thank you all for joining and uh, taking the time after your uh, full day to attend this webinar. So we designed this on cosmic computing. What is cosmic computing? It is handling computing and data at cosmic scale. What is cosmic scale? Obviously the whole universe, or the whole universe scale. Now, why do we care about it? It's a tool, it's a service, it's a capability, it's a powerful tool that we have available, which is coming, which is coming our way by way of big data, by way of artificial new intelligence, by way of many other things. So we want to understand how we could possibly get to that um, cosmic computing. Now I do hear a question about the role of library information professionals in different, different aspects of big data and expertise they need. So you will see some of those questions answered as we go along. So today we'll talk about this is a talk related to uh, a book on big data that uh, was published by McGraw Hill, me as the author. I think it's already on Flipkart and elsewhere. So uh, this book will work a lot on big data. And uh, others, this presentation will be all, all on big data. What are the characteristics of big data? And what's the technologies of big data? And how do you analyze and make sense of big data? And especially using AI. So I'll move, move along. So if you see the next chart, you see that uh, fundamentally this is about uh, from Bhagavad Gita 9.8, um, chapter 9, verse 8, uh, he says, and let me cite from uh, uh, Bhagavad Gita itself, Prakritim swam avasthabha vishriyami puna puna. So, vishrijami puna puna. Prakartim swam avasthabhava vishrijami puna puna, which means that from my own nature I curve and produce again and again. What does that mean? That the cosmos is one giant computer. There are infinite connections among the elements, and we need a new kind of intelligence to abstract and transcend them. And it's the consciousness, it's the un, it's a unified field of consciousness which is that unmanifested cosmic, cosmic computer, uh, computer. It is pure potential. That is what we are engaging with when we talk of cosmic computing. It's unified, it's the consciousness within us and the consciousness of the whole universe, where we all contribute in various ways to create the capability that creates cosmic computing. What's the difference between big data using Hadoop and big data analysis using R? Okay, so we'll talk about what is Hadoop and what is R when we go along. R is a language, Hadoop is a tool for storage. Both are complementary, you can't, you can't do one without the other. And uh, again, let me answer this question, library information professionals. Uh, library, I don't know exactly what library professionals do, uh, but I'm sure they manage large, large organize and curate large amounts of data. Uh, so to the extent you work with lots of data and like to answer interesting questions, I mean, you have everything to do with cosmic computing. A library is the original cosmos of uh, knowledge, right? Some of the largest libraries have obviously the uh, greatest source of knowledge. So those will be answered. So the idea is that um, a cosmic computer is something that's self-referral. It continues to grow in capability. It in, in encompasses the entire cosmos in its scope. Uh, both from data side, computing side, and the nature of interface, um, including you know how you will engage with the cosmic computer. You, you could uh, today we talk through the fingers, through the keyboard uh, on your phone, right? Could press things, but tomorrow it could be more direct, uh, maybe based on thought alone. Uh, what you think is what the cosmos try to fulfill for you. Those are the kind of things that would be very interesting. Let me chat, look at another chat window if there's other people who are asking. Uh, somebody asked, anybody knows job opportunities, big data, I'm sure there are people who can answer that. Uh, there are so many um, things, so many opportunities, business analysts. Okay, somebody's answered. So you can please uh, keep uh, typing in your uh, questions here, I'll try to engage. 
what would the business use of big data? I'll come to that. In fact, those are uh, some of the things I, I engage in, the, in the, my book called Big Data. Um, but let me move along and talk about what is cosmic computing. Uh, as I believe, and it's not uh, it, it's something that sort of uh, the term is cosmic computing is not in you know, very widespread use. Uh, it's uh, my sense of where uh, we all are going that um, it's the art and science of managing data at cosmic scale. So Aman Jyot asks, what is will be the business use of big data? We'll come to that. Uh, in particular, we'll talk about how big data and artificial intelligence come together to create uh, opportunities and knowledge. And in fact, in the very next chart, I'll refer to that a little bit. So it's an interdisciplinary field of what processes and systems and knowledge and data and insights uh, whether structured, unstructured, and real-time or non-real-time. I think cosmic computing is really reaching real-time computing. So it's like Google, right? Google gets you answers within a fraction of a second. Why, why would you accept anything that's slower than that? So that is the level in which Google is already some kind of, uh, of uh, cosmic computer, but imagine much more than that, and we'll come to those applications in a moment. Just imagine infinite correlations, infinite connections, infinite uh, points of connect between various things we do. Um, all of the, all of us who are on this um, on this chat, you know, we are we all are bringing a certain consciousness to it. Uh, question: Please tell us how artificial neural network is related to data analytics. It will come towards the fag end. I think last two slides are explaining what neural networks are and how neural networks can produce learning and learning how to learn itself. So we'll come to that. Uh, and let me move along to the next chart. So part of big data is uh, just like any other data. You have to understand how data is produced at one end and how data is consumed in between how it's processed at various ends. So so entire data life, uh, life cycle needs to be understood. Um, now, big data, by definition, as it is defined, is something that we cannot really get a grip on, you know, from, from using traditional tools. It's kind of huge, right? It's really huge. So, if uh, um, big data, if regular data is like in terabytes and petabytes, then then uh, then your uh, big data is in exabytes and you know further. So, it's 10 to the power 18, 10 to the power 20 bytes. It's really huge. It's at least thousand to a million times bigger than um, bigger than traditional data. Uh, so, why big data can be used in traditional what traditional tools? Because it is that large. It is that large. And when I discuss the types of data, the typical data is tables of uh, data from your uh, your computing, but uh, big data includes uh, data from uh, you know, videos, audios, graphics, those are very large files. How do you store them and access them and store them? So that that big data has to be deal, dealt with differently. And plus it's so much that you cannot really deal with it on one single computer. So how do you handle that um, difficulty? And, and so we'll talk about the uh, characteristics of big data uh, the four V's and then we'll, we'll, we'll come to that and I think in the next couple of slides. Okay, so before we get to that, I was uh, looking at what others are saying about cosmic computer, and I saw that this was a science fiction book written about 50 years ago, and it says, um, there are incredible things still uh, discovered, uh, undiscovered, most of them, I'll come to the questions in a moment, but there is, you can read, probably you can read this. Um, the idea is that somebody was looking for uh, searching for all the capabilities that exist, one of the tools is a giant strategic planning computer called Merlin. Uh, this is a story about hunt for Merlin, and uh, but the leading men could not believe that one couldn't find about it. They had to search for Merlin because of the obs of abiding obsession. Merlin meant everything to them: power, pleasures, and profits unlimited. So that's what cosmic computer will bring to people. Uh, 
you know, power, pleasures, and profits are limited, and uh, service to the whole universe. Uh, so he had known that people will not believe him because, uh, so he wanted to, uh, you know, keep on working with that. that, that that's where the, that's where this idea of, uh, uh, you know, the science fiction comes, fight for the good and the bad. Uh, so. So they could not output, uh, so this is a fabled cosmic computer. This Merlin was a fabled cosmic computer. If you really want to understand what cosmic computer is, then maybe we should, we should all read this book, Little Cosmic Computer. It's available for free uh, on internet. Uh, if you just Google it, a Gutenberg, uh, Gutenberg project. Um, uh, I, I hope you, you are able to download the slides. Uh, I don't know what's the McGraw-Hill policy on uh, releasing the slides. Maybe, maybe not. Anyway, um, what is meant by traditional tools? Traditional tools mean relational tools. Relational uh, databases like uh, DB2 and Oracle databases, etc. Those are the traditional data management tools. And of course, those things are also uh, expanding. Okay, so let's, uh, so this was just some basic fun context and scientific uh, sci-fi sci context to cosmic computing. Now let's move to this very simple chart of how business and technology come together. Uh, somebody asked about how this thing relates to business, big data relates to business, definitely all data relates to business. The, you know, data generates, data is generated from business and data uh, helps uh, generate insights, deliver insights to business. So this is uh, uh, what, what they call BIDM cycle. Um, let's say business is any activity like doing this webinar or you know going to work or studying or buying something is activity business and it, it uh, relates to it uh, generates activities every activity is recorded and that now uh, it's somewhere or the other uh, and then that uh, that generates data the more data there is uh, better and then the data is mined if we know how to mine it how to get uh, analyze it and get to uh, find insights from it and then we get some intelligence. Intelligence means insights, means something, nuggets of wisdom. And when those wisdom are, wisdom is uh, transferred to business, and if there's a courageous executive who actually works on that to improve their business, then the business grows. And then when the business grows, uh, then of course that generates even more data. And that's how basically the cycle has been going on and on. And now you, today we have uh, big data. How much economical quantities? What is how much economical in terms of quantity? I don't understand the question exactly, but uh, um, how much quantity of data can you have? Uh, you know, there's no limits to data. There's no limits to data. So moving to the uh, the slide, this idea is that uh, uh, let me. Uh, Data processing, data life cycle is, goes from some of the fields, you were asking what kind of jobs are there in this area. So start with data, data capturing, data, uh, you know, um, data generation, data cleansing, etc. Then it goes in database, and then from database mm -hmm. it goes into a more organized thing called data warehouse, and uh, then you mine the data, and then you visualize the data. These are all the set of tools that you need to know to be able to deal with the, you know, handling big data end to end. And uh, that's just a context of what we will work on, I mean, what, what is important in terms of working with the data. Okay, so now somebody asked, uh, compared, to, um, compared to other databases, economical compared to other databases, and then this idea of privacy. So, uh, I mean, in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, how economical it is, big data is compared to um, the traditional data. The challenge is how if you have thousand times the data as traditional, you cannot spend thousand times the money into storing it. Um, there is no big enough computer to store them. So I'll come to that in a moment. And uh, what are the sources we can learn from? Um, hopefully we'll, we'll mention that towards the end. Let's, this is one source, so try to learn from here and uh, focus on what we're doing here. And then, you know, if something engages your mind, you know, oh, I like to present data, or I like to um, capture data, or I like to massage data, what part of this whole thing engages you, that would be very important. 
um, the, does big data help in generating program for components uh, I don't know what, which component they're talking about uh, but in which universities institute should I join for higher studies in big data analytics first just just stay with this uh, then we can answer this question about the future later right now you are uh, you know part of a nice session so let's stay with that so this is the data processing uh, life cycle and I don't want to get into any one particular element here we'll talk a little bit of data mining in a bit and then within the context of data mining you will uh, see the role of artificial neural networks moving to the next slide now these are the various kinds of data right what is data data is something that's recorded and uh, there are numeric data, alphanumeric, logical data. You know how to design data tables. Um, you know, name can be alpha and uh, age can be you know, numeric. And whether you're married or not can be a logical field or you're a graduate or not. That's a logical field. And then the numeric data itself is uh, uh, ordinal, where it's mostly colored. Just give them categories. And ordinal, when it's high, medium, low. Uh, interval when you say between ten, 1 to 10 what's the level of pain or less of happiness or uh, real ratio numbers which is your uh, real numbers you know uh, the, like the price of a product is uh, two, 220 rupees or three dollars or hundred dollars and then you have this idea of uh, unstructured data unstructured data is this, which is what is causing uh, this cosmic computing which is everything you type into Facebook, everything you type into Twitter, everything you post on LinkedIn, everything you do with uh, uh, Snapchat, all that is recorded somewhere. Everything you write, don't think it just goes away. It's being used by these companies to understand you. And so every text, every video, every audio, every images, um, all these things we're talking here, this will all form data. And then there is, so that managing this unstructured data uh, is important. How do you manage it? Uh, you have to structure it somehow and then uh, make sense of it. The other way to do it is just deal with unstructured data as it is and if systems can understand big data as they are then it's wonderful. Uh, we don't have to do much structuring. And then there's data about data, metadata, which is the structure of data, means how is every field is designed. Uh, for YouTube video for example you always put up you know, who wrote it and who created it, when was it created, how many people have view, viewed it. Well, that becomes usage statistics, but some metadata about you know, the nature of file, is it an MP4 file and so on and so forth. All that is metadata. Now we go on to discussing what is big data. So you see that BIDM cycle in the back, business, intelligence, business, data, and analytics, and intelligence, that cycle. So that I've pushed a little bit of the background for the purpose of this cosmic computing. Uh, but look at this big cycle called big data cycle. It's not a cycle per se, but this, this is a, um, this idea that um, big data is, the data has grown so big now, right? So it's kind of a part of, the, you still have to analyze it and you know, generate intelligence and do business in the blue cycle. But if you look at this red color, the orange color um, uh, points here, you see that data has volume. Data is so large that you want to find ways to deal with it, and Hadoop is the tool to deal with very large data. Uh, and there is the V for velocity diagonally across down below, where we look at uh, the uh, speed at which data is being uh, generated, and uh, and how do you manage to keep uh, receive all the data in real time, process it at least somewhat in real time, and then later store it. Um, uh, with some processing so that we can generate some more definitive output in the, in, uh, later. Then on the bottom left you see variety. Varieties of various different kinds, variety in terms of form, how the data is shown and size and all that stuff. Uh, function, what is the nature of what the data is, uh, uh, what, what the data, uh, what kind of capability that data comes from. And then the source, is it coming from machines, it's coming from people, it's coming from web, where is the data coming from? Let me see, Ankita Nag is that, uh, he said this te text extracted from Twitter is semi-structured data. What is the difference between semi-structured and unstructured data? Well, so the idea is what is structure, right? So what is unstructured, semi-structured, fully structured data? 
So think of stuff fully structured as tables, whereas rows and columns are three-dimensional rows and columns. And what is unstructured data? A running novel, right? Even a novel has some structure, chapter structure. But let's say what you post on uh, Facebook or Twitter, it's like, or Twitter has some structures, only 140 characters. So some structuring elements are there. It is semi-structured. But Facebook truly is, uh, you know, close to unstructured data. Uh, only structure is that they know exactly who typed in or who posted when, uh, and uh, that's it. Other than that, it can be a small post, a very large mm -hmm. post, a small item, a huge video. You might be able to do various things with the with the, uh, Facebook post. So that is very uh, unstructured. A web uh, log is you know reasonably structured. For example, you know from what URL you are logging in, from what you, into what URL you are requesting, at what time, what page you requested, and was the page given back or not. And the web log is uh, structured data, which is uh, the structure of your usage. Having a cookie on your web, like that structured data. Every time you go under a toll booth or something with a, with a you know, a transponder, RFID transponder, um, then it records, you know, this person passed through this particular thing or or uh, so that's that's a transaction being recorded. So they are structured in many ways, but, but uh, uh, some of the structure, especially human generated data, is highly unstructured. And the other co course of unstructured also comes is some data is being sent 20 times. Um, machines to generate data over and over again. If one equipment is lying in front of a reader, uh, a tag, uh, it'll, it'll, it'll read it 20 times a minute. And then if it's lying for half hour, you know, it'll have thousand uh, values of it. So it's unstructured in terms of how often it comes. We need one reading about that a particular product is lying in this shelf, but that reader might tell send the data you know, 100 times a day, a thousand times a day. So that's, we don't have structure in terms of that it gets exactly one. So different levels, you have to remove duplicates, you move errors, remove, um, you know, too much variability in the size and kind of data. YouTube data, so on the uh, YouTube posts, aren't they very unstructured? Um, can you pause? How to program big data? Yeah. Okay. Let me just take a question. If you talk to me in terms of volume, is a specific guide on how much volume should have like in petabytes? Exabytes would be, yeah, big data. Petabytes and all will be big data. How to program the big data? We'll talk about this technology in just a couple of minutes. So hold, hold your uh, uh, thought for that. And uh, can you please insights on testing in big data. Again, testing is very important to keep uh, the quality of big data. And how to handle structure and, and semi-structured data. Handling means you have to just structure it. And you have to think of structuring for what purpose? What do you want to achieve from that data? Right? We structure everything based on how we do it. So it's, suppose I give you a running cloth, right? Thousands of yards of running cloth. You can cut that cloth to achieve a certain purpose. You want to make a shawl, you will cut it pretty easy and line, long and smooth. But if you make an intricate dress, then you'll have to cut for, you know, your um, your collar and for your uh, uh, <laughs> pocket and your cuffs and you'll have to for the front and the back and uh, you know and if it's women's dress it'll be have some um, celebration or, or some some color so those kind of old things depend on those the structuring depends upon uh, how we do it I will talk about SQL no SQL and new SQL in a moment at least you know, no SQL I'll, I'll come in a moment so this is then a variety and then this idea of veracity the veracity is a fourth week which is that the truthfulness of data. You've heard a lot about fake news these days, right? It impacted the US election, in fact, because there were a lot of fake news generated. Now, how does the internet know that this is true, truth and it's not true? How do you know whether some news out there is truth or not uh, truth? Um, because you're alive, for example, how do you know that what I'm talking about is truth or not truth, or I'm just making stuff up? Uh, maybe you rely on my credentials, you rely on credentials of McGraw-Hill education, um, um, that helps you determine whether this fake or not fake, but people can make up that also. So when you have big data, you may have 80%, 90% uh, correct data, but then maybe five, 10, 20% fake data. People may just leave things outside, uh, throw things inside, and then, then you know, just to, for their own agenda, for their own purposes. 
uh, Hadoop or Spark will we'll come in a moment uh, in the next slide. Uh, big data is similar to when we start a business, such as market, culture, and then how do we trust when it's built. Yeah, so part of that is that this whole thing, a whole bunch of things going on in marketplace, right? There are vendors out there who are giving good products for good price, and there are people who are just cheating and scamming, and they have ads which are misleading. So in big data, everything is included. In cosmic computing, everything is included. It's part of the purpose of big data, sort out the good from the bad, the right from the wrong, and from very, very fluffy to the real um, useful stuff. So how do you deal with all of that stuff? That's the uh, idea of cosmic computing. You want to include everything and yet be able to use your judgment, your uh, power to distinguish between what's useful, what's not useful, what's correct, what's not correct, and then come up with insights to guide your decision to the future. Moving on, here is the uh, big data technology ecosystem for all those who are asking about uh, various elements of uh, NoSQL and stuff like that. You will see uh, references here. If you can see this slide on the left side is data sources, which is that you have um, uh, human to human communication, let's say using social media, and uh, human to machine, machine communication, let's say using uh, web, and then machine to machine communication, where let's say a car talks or something, a machine, a refrigerator pings its status to some computer or an RFID reader is reading the status of a um, particular item lying on shelf or in warehouse somewhere. And then there's also structured data, business data. That, so there are various, various data sources on the left side. In the middle is the big data ecosystem. That's kind of my take on how all the various things come together. So as you see, the data is entering from all the data sources into the data ecosystem. The first thing is this idea of data ingest. It's coming at huge speed, so you need to have a dedicated system to receive it. Because it's like you go into a big office and people come at various speeds, and then you need to have some kind of receptionist who gives you tokens. So to make sure everybody's served, received, and nobody's lost, and you know they're all served in a particular order. So that data ingest system. Now when the ingest is done, then you need to do two kinds of things. Stream computing and batch computing. You know batch computing, right? Batch computing means you have a bunch of data in a table and then you compute something out of it, right? You do certain uh, iterative uh, processing out of it and you get some result. But what is stream computing? Stream computing means you don't look at data as a database. You look at a data stream. You look at a data lake, like a flowing lake. Data is coming to you very fast at huge speeds. And you have to make sense of it right then and there. For example, um, attack on your websites, right? You are checking the uh, links of websites coming to you, and uh, suppose some particular malicious website is pinging you over and over and over and over again with the express purpose of bringing your site down. It may be a competitor, the hired thing, or whatever it is. So you need to figure that out in real time. It's not enough that, okay, well, I'll save the data and 30 minutes later I'll have some output or tomorrow. No, some things have to be checked in real time. Um, so you may do some count by various websites and how much thing is uh, coming from various places. Just do the count and move on. So long as no one particular website's count rises too much, then you know that it's not, uh, there's no denial of service attack. Or there could be other things, you know, uh, let's say credit card access, right? Credit card, you use your credit card and there's credit card fraud. You need to find out in real time that this particular charge doesn't look typically of the, typical of the person or this particular person is in this town and how could they be charged from this, another town. So you have to find a fraud in real time and deny that charge, charge because otherwise you will lose money. So some of this is uh, application of stream computing. And then once this stream computing happens, then you put in data organizing. And this data organizing is essentially this idea that um, you put in some kind of databases from where you can read and again uh, serve the consumer. These databases, because there are various kinds of databases and various lot, very large databases, they go in the general category of NoSQL databases. These are not only SQL databases, but they are non-SQL databases, which are uh, relaxing the constraint of relational database so that uh, you can handle a lot more data, a lot more cheaply. So Aman Jyot asked how expensive it will be to use data. It will be very expensive to use big data. Um, huge data centers are needed to handle um, databases, for example, Google has uh, close to 2 million computers in its various data centers. Well, that's an old number. 
it could be you know more millions of computers facebook gets uh, you know truck loads full of new cpus every day into the data centers because they're growing in data that that huge so it is very large now a um, lot of uh, technologies are there and then i'll come to that for to handle the ecosystem but uh, right beneath that is the horizontal bar for distributed file system right this is how do you create a file system to handle huge amounts of data in a way that's uh, inexpensive so you distribute data on multiple machines because there's no one machine that's so large that it can take in all the data so that's where you use distributed file system like hadoop so file distributed file system now hadoop was uh, created by yahoo uh, based on the design that google published for their own big file system so it's a distributed database system and at the bottom you see this compute storage network it's an infrastructure this is where cloud computing fits in you keep hearing about cloud uh, from Microsoft, from IBM, from um, Google, and from Amazon Web Services. All these cloud offerings provide you basic computing capability of uh, and the storage capability and network capability. So uh, this is these are some of the things that uh, are the basic components. And on the right side is data consumption then. Data consumption is in terms of uh, you can do data mining, data visualization, dashboards, reports, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, R. Are you going to explain about map reduce, please? Now I'm not going to explain about any one technology. I will go to the next chart and explain how these what map reduce does for you. I'm going to the next chart. Here we'll map the various four V's. Remember the four V's I talked about, and then how these map V's relate to the, the technology solution. So you hear, keep, keep hearing these terms of some, all the terms that you're asking, Hadoop and MapReduce and NoSQL and Spark. And these all relate to the challenges that we had in big data, volume, velocity, variety, and in some level, veracity. Veracity handling, handling veracity is a little bit different. But R can be used to handle all of these things. So R can be used for programming on all this data, but the other languages are Python. I happen to like R, and there's an R tutorial at the end of my book, the data analytics book, and but we have developed a Python tutorial also. Python is also very popular. But let's get to what are these mapping data challenges and how do you map them, the technologies. So first thing is volume, right? So the challenge is how do we, um, Sharad Kumar said there are many other uh, Vs like value. Yeah, so value is obviously the year to figure out the value of each of these elements and that there are so many Vs you can keep adding, um, but uh, and, and you can be more specific uh, on what value means and keep on going like that with other Vs. Volume, avoid risk of data loss of machine. So the solution is to replicate in multiple machines. Every piece of data has to be stored in at least one, two, and three places, right? So if any one piece, a copy of the data dies, the other two copies are available. And uh, even if two die, then you know it's available. Um, chan the chance of all three copies of data lying is probably one in like a mm, gazillion, you know, more than one, one a trillion. So that's why every data piece is safe if it's copied at least three times. So the Hadoop distributed file system is a solution to handle volume of data. Now you go to volume and velocity of data because data is coming very fast rate and a huge amount of data coming very fast. So if you kept on moving data to where the processor is, uh, then you will then choke the network capacity and uh, instead of doing uh, the moving the uh, data to the computer you move the processor to the data and that's where move processing logic in small quantities uh, in a distributed manner so let's say you are searching for the term big data or you're searching for um, um, uh, a nice new watch smart watch and you want to search through all of Google's database for what are the best references for a smartwatch. So you can distribute the search for into all of the two million computers and say, give me what are the best hits on smartwatch. So that's mapping out the search and then receive all the intermediate uh, uh, inputs, outputs from there, and then bring it to reduce function and then reduce the best uh, hits on smartwatch or whatever idea you have. And then uh, a smartwatch, and then list the prioritized order. That's how Google gives you the top 10 or 15 pages on smartwatch or, or your chosen term. And that's how MapReduce works. To those who ask how MapReduce works, this is the basic idea of MapReduce. Not every processing job can be broken down into mapping and reducing framework, but there's some jobs that lend themselves to sort of 
two-step processing, the mapping process and the reducing process, you do a little simple computing in millions of computers, and they come back and then consolidate that output, what we call reduce the output, and then you get the output, uh, final output. Is there any processing tool available? There are lots and lots of uh, uh, tools available. What uh, technology is veracity related to? No, none. That's why these are the three main uh, tools that the uh, three challenges that you can relate. With veracity, you'll have to build some templates. You have to find some ways of checking what is true or not. But let's come to third, variety. Now, efficient storage of large and small and variety of data objects, you know, documents and graphs and uh, uh, large text files and everything else. So we create what is called solutions columnar databases with key and value. There's a key value such as a running serial number and the value is whatever is associated with that key. Now value could be a number like uh, your name or your age or your personal record which might be a few kilobytes or it could be a whole movie, you know, Shah Rukh Khan's movie, you know, the set six, nine gigabytes worth of value associated with a particular ID. So what is the value? So if this is the a key, key is fixed size, but the value could be anything from, you know, just a kilobyte to a you know, gigabyte or many gigabytes. So this idea is that we create a key and value, and then with the uh, with that value we can get out to reach out some uh, more things out there. Um, we have cap theorem. We will not talk about cap theorem. These are all things about um, that you can read in the book. Uh, cap is this, uh, that idea that you cannot have uh, consistency, availability, and partition tolerance all in the same uh, instance of uh, data set. But uh, uh, you will have to start, you know you have to. Uh, make some with, with big data because data is applicated in many, many places then uh, you will have to live with some um, uh, sort of uh, latency issues. Uh, Ankita says string of uh, storing duplicate data and distributed cells with not increase velocity of data doesn't decrease efficiency. Yes it decreases the efficiency but you know the point is cost is of the sense instead of buying a single computer big computer for two million dollars you might be able to buy a small Linux computer for $100 and you can have like 2,000 computers for that and that will give you a huge amount of capacity. So it's a cost and uh, efficiency um, trade-off. In any case, there is no one computer that can handle that much data. So you have to necessarily break down the data into multiple things. Anyway, let me go to the fourth uh, V here is uh, fourth challenge is velocity. Just the nature of the, 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 the streams are so large and that uh, how do you handle that? That's why you use the fork shaped architecture. The same data comes in and goes either through the uh, streaming data streaming or goes to the um, batch computing. So there's fork shaped architecture which is known in various names, Del, uh, what is it called, um, uh, Delta architecture or, um, but the idea is that Apache Spark is the new tool that kind of replaces uh, Hadoop in terms of processing stream computing, streaming data, as well as the, as well as the batch data. Uh, what other question is there? Thank you, Kanchan. Thank you. Appreciate that. How replication data and extreme data management? What extreme data management? Replication is done by the system. So you just bring in data. Hadoop automatically takes care of storing. So this is not a webinar on Hadoop. This is a uh, thing of cosmic computing of which big data is a big part. I want to get to the application, interesting application, but I wanted to map for you what is the challenge, all these V's of big data and how it goes. So if you want to understand more, you can go to uh, get my book and hopefully uh, you will be able to get a better grip on how these technologies are there. And each of the you know, chapters and explains all of this, uh, the big data ecosystem separately, what is to do, what is, so you'll have very detailed examples on each of those um, uh, topics, NoSQL, uh, Hadoop, and Spark, and all this stuff. Now, just jumping into data mining, and we, I see we are kind of getting close on time, uh, so that I can leave some type of question. How can small scale, medium scale use it? Yeah, you can use it um, using cloud. You can store using cloud. Can you, the name of the, the name of the book is Big Data. Please, somebody can hand, I uh, can, McGraw-Hill people, can you give the flip card uh, thing? It's just called Big Data. If you search for Big Data and put in my name, Anil Maheshwari, then you will see this. Uh, you, maybe somebody can send the URLs to you all for, uh, for this. Uh, yeah, somebody sending? Uh, McGraw-Hill people, please send those uh, that URL. It's called Big Data. Um, anyway, so data mining, 
or the nature of engaging this uh, file, the data to get uh, patterns. So you can have data mining is the idea of discovering patterns, you know, general, general, accurate, simple patterns. Uh, the big, big data visualization tools also in there. Uh, all the, you know, so you can include the V value and seeing all these things. Uh, let me maybe put in a question itself. It's called big data. So I'm going to type the name of the book. So for those uh, available on here, you search by my name, and you should be able to see it. And hopefully, that can reach you. Yeah. So there's two kinds of learning: supervised learning, unsupervised learning. Uh, and I explained some of these things in the previous webinar. So hopefully, McGraw-Hill people can make available the previous webinar for you. Um, and uh, supervised learning when you know the right answer and train something to do better, like in an exam, right? You do take an exam and there's a right answer. So every time you don't make the right answer, they've given you this is the right answer for that reason. And the next time you do better, aha! So you learn like that. Exploratory pattern is okay, let me see what's going on. So you just explore what might be happening. And so it's much more unsupervised learning. But let me keep on moving here. So now we, we talk in terms of uh, data mining process. Again, I'll skip that. It's a step-by-step -step process how you go about data. Those who are saying what are some of the tools and opportunities, you can see that there are various aspects of the data mining. Start with business understanding, then data understanding, then modeling, checking the model, evaluating, and then in between you, this, if you see a generic step, understanding the application domain, what does business want, and uh, you know, identifying data and then all that stuff and pre-processing data. That's a big part of opportunity in big data for all of us, uh, all people in India especially, to be able to handle that. Uh, and then, then how do you do the data mining, etc. So anyway, I'll just move along to the artificial intelligence part. I want to get there. And there's are various techniques you see, various the regression and decision trees, clustering. I've explained some of this in my previous webinar, so you can take a look at those. Um, but uh, association rules, and then I've moved the neural networks towards the end just to be able to spend a couple of minutes explaining to you what neural networks do. Big data visualization, yeah, Tableau is a big tool for that. I mentioned uh, what we can use the free data available internet, put in software, Hadoop, and is, is it possible? Yeah, so free data is, uh, yeah, a lot of data belongs to you. All the data on Twitter, you can get uh, Twitter downloads on any hashtag, um, for free, you just have to open an account, which is free account, it takes five minutes, and they give you a token, and then you can download stuff. So yes, you can put in Hadoop or wherever, and then most important thing is, what do you want to answer? What is the question? If you don't have a good question, then you'll be just buried under the data. You will not know what to do with the data. So what neural networks do is, it's a, at the bottom of this the chart, you can see versatile machine learning taking for deep learning with structured as well as structured data. So you can feed structured data, structured uh, answers, and um, uh, structured uh, list of a table of data there, and uh, or you can just even sometimes the, 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 the most exciting part in AI now is that it can learn by itself. Uh, so let me come to that in the next chart. So this is a little uh, view of what uh, neural network architecture is. Uh, it, it it mimics your you know brain's neurons. There's no one neuron in your brain. There are about how many? Can you know how many how many neurons are there in your br brain? Anybody knows? Anybody want to type? Okay, there are about hundred billion neurons in your brain. Okay, so hundred billion neurons, right? And so there's no one one neuron who answers your question. It's one neuron computes something, sends to somebody else, somebody else. So there's a layers of neurons which receive some input from the outside, and then there's like you do layers of processing and then some output goes up. So that, that uh, um, processing is what allows us to do very sophisticated uh, computing very fast. Uh, um, how do we mimic uh, that behavior uh, in, in computing? And that's where the deep neural networks or deep learning is coming in. Moving on. 
This idea of artificial intelligence is multiple levels. So at, at, the outer, at the more holistic level, AI means everything, including knowledge bases, expert systems, some of these things you might have heard, the any ways in which we can store knowledge and intelligence is stored. But then there's machine learning, various algorithms where a machine can uh, learn something from given structured data and then produce some nice output. But then there's a new field called deep learning in the last few years, especially ever since Google bought this company called DeepMind. In, uh, in, in London, which have been doing fantastic computing, um, given very little direction. They, are, they know how to play games, they learn how to, uh, what the rules of the game are themselves. So that's the fun thing, and that's the one that's um, threatening humanity in some level, uh, because <clears throat> just like we figure out, right, whether it's this webinar is worth joining or not, we make that decision. We, we'd like to learn about that webinar you know, and, and who to listen to or not, veracity. Uh, same way, a neural network can also choose, hey, this input is uh, valid, this one is really an outlier or invalid or fake or this or that. So all that learning itself is being done by this uh, you know, neural network. Um, so okay, somebody's trying to trick me, so I'm going to ignore that and stuff like that. So here is the application. Those who have been asking about what are the applications of big data. Now, most uh, neural networks, let's say artificial intelligence, yeah? one of the most uh, um, most exciting applications has been this idea of uh, why, why is it not coming? Okay. Can you see something? Okay. So it has a build. Why is it not coming? Slide that has frozen some level. Hmm. So let me open my my copy of the slide deck and run from there. So one of the big applications is this idea of gaming. You know, so strategic gaming. Um, so you know, you look at Alpha Alpha Go uh, beat the world Go champion. And uh, then you also saw Watson play Jeopardy. It's an American quiz game about in 2011, six years ago, they beat the world champion. And uh, another application is cognitive computing, cancer diagnosis, handwriting recognition, face recognition, recipe design. Now, these are some things that uh, you know that, uh, uh, oh, I should click here, I was, okay, okay. Sorry, I was clicking the wrong button, that's why it's not moving forward. Strategy, gaming, AlphaGo, and Watson for Jeopardy, cognitive computing. So given all the research on cancer, given all the symptoms that somebody has, how do you make a uh, cancer diagnosis? Face recognition is a more, very fascinating field. How does Facebook, for example, um, understand how, what, who is who? You know, you have to look at all these things and you can have a good day or a smiling day or you know your hair might be disheveled or it might be well kept or you might be wearing a coat or you're wearing just t-shirt how do you still recognize in the whole context that this is you know x or this is y this person so all that is fantastic and uh, cognitive computing is being used for with uh, recipe design so if you look up a book called cognitive cooking that's written by ibm about three four years ago uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, things that have been, uh, let me see if there are anybody here who needs to, okay, just wanted to make sure that I'm not missing out any questions somewhere. Uh, can you use ANN, SVMs, other mind taking big data? Exactly, yes, definitely we can use these techniques, yeah. Then another thing is automation. You're seeing this uh, intelligence being used for autonomous cars, robotics, drones, and chatbots. You know how many chatbots does uh, uh, Facebook have? When you talk to um, Facebook, it's not a human being that comes online most 99% of the time. What are the, uh, how many chats they have, uh, how many chatbots they have? They have about uh, 10 million uh, chatbots, or maybe in the millions uh, chatbots who are constantly talking to people to answer their questions and it, it's very hard to 
decipher whether you're talking to a person or to a computer. Uh, so, and then uh, Amazon does dynamic pricing based on who you are, where you are, how much you bought, how badly you want. So it's not like the one, one price they have. So soon you know, Flipkart will do the same, I'm sure. Autonomous cars, you know, soft driving cars. Isn't that amazing? Um, that you sit in the car, back of the car, and do whatever you want to do. And um, of course, at some level, uh, it's one of the you know easiest and fun capability that we have of driving car. But it's a learned capability. That right? you know, tomorrow cars will drive by themselves. Drones, you know, how many of you have done so drones flying? You can buy a drone and just have it hover over your place, and you can have a camera which you can direct, and you can record a whole event from there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, then, uh, then, then of course, then of course, it's, uh, we are deep learning, learning to learn the rules of the game. If you look for deep learning, uh, and then uh, there's a short video which shows how you know, Pac Man, remember the Pac Man game? The Pac Man game? Where sort of you keep moving and just gobbling up. How do you train a, a neural network to learn how to play Pac Man? What they found, Google's DeepMind uh, unit in London has just thrown that screen. In other words, you play this game and then you just have a, the, the, the neural network just have a camera. Basically, we feed the pixels to them, the pixels of the screen to them. And from the pixels, he figures out what the rules are, what are the best strategies are, and then it'll learn, learn to play the game better than uh, human beings. And so very often it'll create sort of multiple copies of it and they play with each other and then uh, um, they will they will just get better and better by practice. So one of the things is all there's no magic thing other than practice. Except that in computer you can practice million times within a few months, whereas human beings you know get bored when practicing, etc. Let me see what other questions. Okay, there are more questions here. Let's see where. Okay, so there's nothing. So then I would say, uh, basically imagination is the limit to what you can do, yeah? In one final chart, I will leave you with the, the idea of cosmic computing. Think of smart city, smart planet. You've heard of this idea of a smart planet coming from uh, IBM. What does that mean, right? India is going a big time into smart planet, etc. So what does it mean? It means that, it means many things. Uh, smart living, flourishing. Uh, uh, recently, I'm very fascinated by this idea of use of for these technologies to make life smarter. So, uh, it can be smart citizens. You know, we are enabled, empowered, uh, and then it can be smart health. Everything that uh, you know, so all of these areas are the areas in machine learning and you know, big data, etc. You're looking for applications, the area for research. These all questions. Smart health. What does it mean to be smart health? Most efficient way of delivering healthcare in the right place at the right cost, whether it's telemedicine or whether it's uh, electronic health records or whether it's uh, you know personalized medicine, evidence-based medicine, all these things. Smart education, well, it's already happening, right? You're looking at this webinar, you've chosen to join this, webinar will be available, and then you have the MOOCs courses, you have the degrees and you know various training materials and books and all that stuff available. A smart energy, how do we minimize the losses and uh, make it efficiently available. Smart transportation, think of multimodal transportation. As soon as you get off from, like in Bombay, the system is pretty efficient, right? You get off the train and you get to uh, the bus. In many cities, it's not there. But how do you sort of size the timing and based on how much traffic there is, that many more buses should come. So it should be very smooth. You get from place from another one to another very comfortably at low cost and uh, very speedily. Uh, smart spaces how to create spaces where people like to hang around and uh, chit chat and all that stuff. So all of that stuff is very important. Well, let me see if there's anything. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I see that these people have actually um, put in the information on the book. Maybe they'll send it again so that you can uh, purchase the book. Oh, I didn't realize they gave a 25% discount if you do that. Um, Ravi Kiran said, when an organization feels to go for big data with what cost? You have to start with experimenting. I'll take a couple of minutes. I'll stop here, but I'll, I'll let's take a couple of questions. Anybody else who's not asked questions, I would love to hear from you. Um, how do you start? I mean, it's small, or whatever. You start with some. 
whatever your field is, you know, try to, if let's suppose you're in healthcare business, you know, some uh, medicine business, or you're doing, uh, delivering people uh, some sort of a smarter care for bones, you know, uh, or, or uh, if bone breaks down, how do you get that grown up together? Or mental health is a huge thing. How do you deliver mental health education effectively uh, through through meditation, through uh, through uh, knowledge, through um, some techniques, through some support network, whatever it is that uh, uh, you do. So I will ask, what are the PhD topics in uh, this machine learning? All of them. Well, I mean, if you come from a completely computer science perspective, there'll be Neural networks are a huge area on how to make it more efficient. How is big data connected to data science field? Big data is a big part of data science, and that's what data science has emerged because of big data. The big data field has kind of morphed into data science. Um, what else is going on? Let's see. I saw some questions coming back. How big data is related to AI? AI can deal with data which is un, uh, unstructured, and then it can make sense of it. What are the recent technology which are using them? As I said, neural networks, uh, deep mining, uh, deep mind kind of technology, multi-layered neural network. Search for this company called Deep Mind. Deep Mind out of UK. It's owned by Google. They acquired it about three or four years ago. And they're the ones who are generating AlphaGo, which is the Go champion. Uh, can I use inspired biocomputing algorithm? I don't know what inspired by academic algorithms is, but I'm sure there are algorithms of all kinds to handle large amounts of data. Uh, what are recent technologies, as I said, uh, these are all coming out of uh, research capabilities uh, to handle several things. But recent technology also, you know, see the systems in um, self-driving cars. The, almost anybody can design a small drive. It's a self-driving car system these days with the probably, uh, you know, maybe 40, 50,000 rupees, you can design a whole thing. Uh, what is that for cosmic computing? I forgot. Does cosmic help a lot in data mining? Well, the cosmic computing is bigger than data mining. Cosmic computing is bringing everything together, data, the computing, the visualization, everything together. All the, all the implementation, and then uh, different, inter well, that's a, that's a big thing. That's a fascinating thing. And, and structured data, you give them the uh, same, some good uh, things, uh, some good data, and then it trains on that. But with unstructured data, also neural networks, these are beginning to learn. For example, give them a million pictures of cats, million pictures of dogs. Let it figure out how a uh, 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 cat is different from a dog, or to be able to differentiate. Those are the kind of things that uh, are the fascinating things in big data computing. Uh, Big year visualization, too? yeah. Tableau is a good one. And what are career roles in cosmic computing? The whole range, everything I talked about from application side of smart cities, planet, you know, various domains from spaces, sanitation, connectivity, governance, smart health education, infrastructure, cloud computing, anything um, would be opportunity for uh, jobs in big data. What are your thoughts on the war of jobs in man versus machines? Well, what's happening is this uh, idea that uh, machines have always been used to do boring jobs or laborious jobs. Machines take care of uh, driving your, uh, washing your dishes or, you know, you don't have to move, you go into a car. That's a machine we're using. Um, long time ago, people have said we should walk or we should use horses for it. Uh, then at some point in India, we had a big debate uh, when I was growing up about uh, um, should we print, uh, do anything with computers? Like today, can you live without online railway reservations? Well, there was a big debate around there. So jobs will go, but and time is released. Uh, for example, you sit in an autonomous car, right? And then how do you use that time that is released for you? You can have joy, you can have fun, you can do talking. Um, and uh, uh, so more jobs will be created based on facilitating the best use of time when you're sitting in an autonomous car and sitting relaxed instead of driving and paying attention to the road that the machine paid to the road so jobs driving jobs are going away anyone sort of interested in becoming taxi driver or cab driver or truck driver you know or on that where you know driving is a big part of delivery all that those jobs are going to go away you know, relatively soon but there are all kinds of other jobs that will open up based on you know, how to deliver joyful spiritual experience. I think yoga, meditation, mental peace, uh, those are fantastic area. Uh, I think uh, 
uh, as jobs go away, but more importantly, the economy transforms, the world transforms. You need to transform yourself. Um, how do you transform yourself? It's not just learning more, because then that just, your brain is like this, and you keep getting more and more after a while, it gets crowded. You need to expand the container, so you need to learn something, meditation technique. At our institution, we do a, a you know, transcendental meditation. So learn TM at TM.org or Vipassana or you know, so high quality technique. TM is a great technique and uh, learn that and then that helps you expand the container so you can creatively find new jobs for yourself. You know, it's also being called gig economy. Your small task, small project, do it. You know, so Amazon's Mechanical Turk is uh, another website which where you can uh, get to see what kind of jobs are people wanting or doing. Okay, finish all writing. Okay. Do I see any more questions here? Let me see. Okay, anything else? Cosmic data, co 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 cloud, I, I mentioned cos cloud computing as one of the layers of uh, technologies at the bottom uh, uh, in the, in the my in infrastructure. Latest topic of big data for implementation, what does that mean, latest topic? Wow. <laughs> All of these are topics, so it will depend on your interest. Latest is deep, latest is deep learning. Latest is, uh, that's where you should go to, it's called deep mind. This is the, not the, what is it called? Deep mind. Yeah. Deep mind from Google, right? Just try to see some videos from deep mind from Google. I think you will enjoy that. They'll, they'll give you ideas of what fascinating things have been done and what you could do that. Okay, any other questions? How far cosmic is going to boom along with big data? Cosmic computing is the future, you know. It will not be some solo one person doing a single thing, etc. That will not make a lot of sense. Um, you know, why is Google so valuable? Because it brings the web pages of everybody from HP to Flipkart to Amazon to Google. I mean, all kinds of pages come together and uh, all those things to come together and make available to give the best search. They're not saying, oh, we don't know this part of the web, so we'll give you based on what we know. There's no isolation. If, if you're feeling isolated, if you're doing solo work to, without a uh, connection, then you know your work is not going to be that powerful compared to a cosmic computer where you have millions of machines, but more importantly, gazillions amount of data. Data is king, and that's why big data is a big thing, and big data is creating the cosmic computer. Think of, again, rolling back, curving back on my own nature, I create again and again and again. In other words, that's what Bhagavad Gita, in Bhagavad Gita, uh, Lord Krishna said to Arjun, that this is my nature, it's my infinite nature. Your own nature is infinite. You need to just find a way of, to tap into it, to have the creativity to generate everything. IoT, I didn't mention IoT other than the sources of data, um, that's, that's, you see the data sources on the left side, uh, Internet of Things, there's this idea of machine-to-machine -machine data, and that is absolutely uh, driving the large data. The machines talk to each other, I give example of RFID tags, etc. Smart, smart cities, yeah, being, are being implemented uh, using IoT, absolutely. Um, smart cities is one moniker for it, IoT is a more technical view of it. Um, in Europe, they use the future of the internet. The future of the internet is really going into cities. So there are various ways, you know, coming out from various perspectives to talk about the same idea that internet and computing is coming together to make life flourishing and smarter. And what is my next chart? It's I think uh, it's probably asking for Q and A, right? So and the last one is. Thank you, and so we're delighted to have you in this thing, and I hope you will be able to, um, well, Cassandra, Edgebase, etc. I mentioned NoSQL databases, um, but you can look up more. In the, my book, I've explained in very, very, very simple terms. If you like this webinar, this is the same style in which I explained a lot of those things, so I hope you will enjoy reading it, and uh, if you like it, please leave a review on the Flipkart site, I cannot request enough because this is how your feedback makes life uh, wonderful for others. You know, remember, we are not solo people. We listen and we forget. Everything we do, if we can offer uh, insight. Thank you, Rajesh. 
we, we offer others our insights, what we like, and then you know, it just makes uh, people better aware of what are opportunities for doing this. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, cosmic computing and stream analysis we just talked about. Stream analysis is a part of cosmic computing. And uh, thank you, Ravi. And uh, rest, I'm sure McGraw-Hill people can give you references to previous webinar, which was actually fantastic. He also did a Facebook chat. So let this cosmic waves purify your soul. Very well said, Saurabh. I appreciate that. Very nice. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. So, okay, thank you guys. Enjoy it having you here and McGraw people. Now you can stop this. And uh, thank you very much.